Um, so as Katie said, uh, the first panel this morning is all about setting the scene. There's lots of panels through the day where we'll be going into much more detail, but what we'll be talking about to begin with is really just some more of the macro levels, uh, issues that we're facing as an industry. Uh, we're very fortunate that we're going to be joined, uh, as Katie just said, by Matt from Lotus, uh, but also Antonio, who's a Vice President uh, at Cummins and uh, has a European role and responsibility. So I think before that, I think we have an introductory video. The heavy duty engine and vehicle industry in the UK has faced more significant challenges over the past three years and in living memory. Brexit, COVID, significant supply chain shortages, and now the crisis in Ukraine. Having a period of regulatory certainty with clear deliverables will be the key to the sector's success. The state of the UK automotive market at the moment for us is mixed feelings. We're in the most difficult trading conditions we've ever known with parts supply logistic issues and energy costs rising. But that's against the backdrop of the strongest demand we've ever known for our products. As we move forward, we have a new trilemma to manage. That is the continuation of supply challenges, the energy transition, as well as the economic challenges that we all face. Okay, so uh, Antonio is joining us remotely. Hey Antonio, good morning. Uh, we couldn't hear you then, Antonio. Could you try again, please? Hi, good morning, and sorry. Hi, Matt, and hi, Dean. Hey, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Perfect. Good. The challenges of hybrid work, and we're still working them through. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, gentlemen, let's let's dive straight in. So, I think we, we've touched on some of the the macro themes already through the early um, the introduction, but I think it's fair to say, as an industry, we've been in transformation for many many years. You know, if we go back 10, 15, 20 years, we were wrestling with how to move to just-in-time manufacturing, globalization, economies of scale, and much more recently, that's been impacted by COVID. Uh, through the pandemic, by the, the change around uh, climate, the climate emergency, uh, and also the geopolitical crisis that we face as well. So with that as the backdrop, um, what's, what has 2022 looked like for each of you within your businesses? And Matt, I'll come to you first, if that's okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it was quite nice to, uh, the lead in for me was to have the chairman of our board come and talk to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm smiling because that investment figure he talked about, a lot of it has come Lotus's way. So we're very happy with that. Um, I think the challenges are wide. I mean, let's, let's, not, um, let's not beat around the bush. The, 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 the conditions that we've got for the business, trading conditions, are as worse as I've ever known. And uh, they just keep getting worse as well, you know. There's, there's, there's big impacts around the globe. Um, instability around war, which is terrible obviously, but logistics and part supply. And um, we were just doing the press release and we, we said, uh, somebody said to me, oh, we've got a daily meeting on part supply, so have we. And I think that's, most senior managers in the automotive industry are doing that now. We are chasing parts in daily. But as I said in my introduction, um, we will get through it. We always get through it. We are, um, we, you know, we're a strong industry. We know how to survive and for us particularly demand is there so it gives you the confidence that you it's worth the effort because you know the demand for the products are there afterwards okay excellent thank you matt and antonio you have a slightly different perspective with as a european uh, leader in the business as well what would your thoughts be yeah we have uh, as also i say we have also in our industry a very strong uh, demand for our products across most of our our regions globally and also our markets, we see a demand in uh, transformation of goods continue to be very strong across most of the key market, uh, US, Europe, uh, UK, of course, but across all the market and uh, segment like uh, the data centers growth, we continue to see a very growth. We have announced uh, after a very record year in 2021, so we'll be uh, announcing a record year in 2022. Our first uh, quarter was uh, very, very strong with uh, over 8% increase to compare 2021. And we announced also a record um, podcast for this year over 8% compared to 2021. Very strong demand across our region. But uh, 
as Matt said, we have also the same issues across all our industry, and it's uh, challenging also about uh, getting uh, uh, um, parts um, companies across all our industry has become also a very, very, very challenging uh, in uh, our time. Uh, despite that, we continue to see uh, advance in our technology also too. Cummins are investing over 70 million pounds or so in the uh, in, uh, UK for new products. And, uh, and we continue to develop uh, in the technology edge of, of um, solution for our customers. And uh, we see a very good transition also for zero emission is helping also to be uh, thinking about the future. And of course, uh, our focus on the commercial vehicles is focused to reduce emissions and decarbonization, and uh, is a little different than the passenger car. We have uh, different ways of technology about, uh, for the future is why we're going to develop and is why we're very confident about, uh, about the future. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you, Antonio. I think what was interesting then, some of the themes that we're already teasing out here, that these issues that we're facing, they're not isolated in the UK. They are clearly global. They're international, just with slightly different uh, perspectives. I think also uh, since the business performance is going well. The industry is challenged, but there are very good business performance being seen through the year so far. Uh, just from a financial perspective, Matt, are you seeing that as well so far through this year? The challenges are there. I think um, th there's where the pressure is on the business is is on the cost of goods really and and logistics. Um, logistics for one, uh, you know, we're seeing prices that are four times what we'd expected and we're budgeted for. Um, we at Lotus have made the decision that we're going to commit to the price uh, of the products that have been bought or on deposit at the moment. Um, we are struggling with uh, part supply, so we're a little bit late to market with these products, but I think it was very important for us to go out and fix the price because it takes the uncertainty out for, for our customers. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. And uh, I mean, business revenue-wise uh, is very strong for us. Uh, and will continue to be, but margins are, very, are getting very thin. Okay, okay, thank you, Matt. So Mike talked as well in the opening around uh, Brexit, and I think last week was the six-year anniversary of uh, when the referendum was, and it's you know, 18 months since we left after the transition period. Uh, Antonio, question for you. There, there are many challenges that's introduced in the last 18 months, but if we look ahead and we look forward, what are your thoughts and your views around what Brexit could mean for us as an industry, but particularly around regulation? Yeah, as, a, as a, I'm a French Portuguese, been living also in UK for many years, you can see that I may have a strong view about Brexit. And I think that we have, like many also businesses, we have our own issues when we move, when we did the transition to Brexit in 2000, 2018, uh, 2020, sorry, 2020. And again, we have seen a lot of issues around uh, customs and also paperwork has been a very uh, challenging for us during the first uh, first months of the of the transition. Again, and also, uh, as you mentioned, also one of the things that is going to be very, very important for us is uh, emissions. And we make sure that uh, we are moving to a, a strong emission for the Euro 7. We want to make sure that we maintain a connection between Europe and UK. That I think that is important for us. We we don't to see a diversion on the emissions, and uh, and uh, we are continue to invest again, uh, as I mentioned, be probably about new products across all Europe, and it's important for us to make sure we maintain this similarity or very close. And <clears throat> we are very in favor to have a stringent uh, emission across uh, all our. our markets and of course uh, the euro 7 that will be implemented uh, uh, we are somewhere that we are disappointed that we are again delay has been delayed uh, to november of this year's edition about the emissions but because i believe that is important for us to have a uh, continue to reduce emission across our products and we are very in favor to continue to be stringent emissions it means uh, uh, we export over 1.6 million pounds or so to mainland europe that is important for us, is why the, the market is important for for, for Cummins. And, uh, and uh, as I said also, that uh, as I mentioned in the previous again, the Eurozone is important for us, is why we want to maintain also, and I hope the uh, UK will be able to, after the announcement of Europe emission, will be able to also implement the Eurozone also in the UK. Okay, okay, thank you, Antonio. Okay, Matt. Um, 
with Lotus as a, a sports car manufacturer, what are the, some of the maybe unique challenges that you're, you're facing uh, in your business, other than what you've mentioned already? Uh, so, I mean, Lo Lotus's plan, and I think Daniel Lee um, introduced it very well, is that we are transitioning from a niche sports car manufacturer. We made 1,500 cars last year. Uh, and by 2027, we'll be making 100,000 cars a year that are full EV. So that's Lotus's transition. It's it, it, it's massive. Um, I think I think I can see uh, the change in the business now as the confidence is growing in the products we've got out there and the and the performance you're seeing from Lotus. I mean, early challenges were investment. I think I think. Uh, being a small company with the track record we had was difficult to get investment, but it's also um, people people understanding the investment that's required for the transition to EV as well. And, and I know that most companies uh, with passenger cars uh, are committed to going to full EV, and um, that, that that can't just be reliant on the on the automotive uh, companies to do that. It needs some structural changes around investment. Um, be it in education, infrastructure. Uh, so th th I see there's a real opportunity there, um, particularly in the UK. You know, we, we've always been innovative uh, market leaders and we should take that opportunity uh, for the transition to the electric era. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's been our main challenge, I suppose, is getting the support we need for the, for the transition. Okay. And, and just, just coming back, if I heard correctly, uh, Matt, you mentioned that you're going from 15,000 to 100,000 by 27. 1,500. 1,500, sorry, Mike. <laughs> 1,500, where even more uh, significant growth. Are you able to share any more details in terms of how you see that playing out over time? It's a huge growth in five years. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Lotus, uh, Lotus is, is now a global company. Um, we've, we've invested 100 million in, in uh, Norfolk, so we've done three new factories there for Amira, Via, and for producing our platforms. But we've also produced a factory in China, um, which will be where the significant growth in the business is. So we have uh, what we call a lifestyle car. So we talked about Electra in the introduction, which is an SUV. About 90% of production will be uh, in China. But for us in the UK, we'll be going from 1,500 cars to 10,000 sports cars by 2027. And we're looking to build on that as well. So it's... Um, it, it's uh, <laughs> You get the investment and people think, you know, it's great. But the, the thing, I suppose, the things we've had to work on is the culture, um, growing the industry, uh, growing the business as well, but trying to keep it Lotus, you know, not losing that because we are a people business and um, that contact with the people in the business is really important. But Geely, for instance, and I think you can see that with the other brands, um, they, they invest in the brand and the people and the opportunity. They don't come in to look to change these companies. So Lotus is, a, is as Lotus as it's always been. The products are engaging and uh, enjoyable to drive. Okay, okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll talk about people a little bit more in a moment. Um, just excuse the pun, but switching gears a little. Uh, I've got a two-part question. Antonio, I'll come to you first if that's okay. So as we, mm -hmm. as we move through the transition, uh, we're, we're talking about for Lotus, it's uh, about pure battery, battery electrification, but there clearly are other applications, other use cases that may need alternative uh, powertrain solutions as well. So Antonio, I'm just wondering from your perspective, what, how do you see the different powertrain technologies uh, being developed and then rolling out over the next 10, 15, 20 years? Sure, it's a good question, Matt. I, I, the commercial vehicle is a unique uh, also uh, set of challenges, and it's come some time uh, be frustrated because we compare the, the commercial vehicle also to the to the passenger car that is a little different, is a little different, and uh, we have not again we don't have a server billet about the different solution for the for the commercial vehicle because it's a different applications, and we believe that there will be also different solution of powertrains. We still believe that as a, as a ICE engine also with hydrogen, for example, we are investing on hydrogen with uh, with internal combustion engine. That will be a place. We have also developing also, of course, uh, electrification again for our, our different kind of application we have in a, in a, um, trucks and also uh, construction machineries. And also we are investing also in a fuel cell because again that is also something that uh, for different application like trains uh, we have uh, refuse trucks. We have uh, means that in our industry we see different. Uh, 
uh, power chain solutions. We go from, of course, we still, again, we are investing in Euro 7, again, that you maintain for some years, and we also uh, we are investing uh, in uh, electrification because it's a place also for some application in a, in a, in a small trucks or last mile trucks and also uh, for buses that, that we are investing but also the fuel cell also have a place also too for the future in a, we had uh, had some also investment with a um, uh, train for Alstom for example and we are doing for uh, also buses and different kind of is why we have seen a different uh, solution for our our markets that will be a different offering power, different power train solutions to deliver to our customers. Okay, thank you, Antonio. So I think I'm, I'm hearing that there's clearly going to be a need for a portfolio of solutions. And I'm, I'm wondering, Antonio, is there a difference as well in terms of the geographies uh, where, where you'll work as well, in terms of the, the geographical differences between what would drive those solutions? Of course, again, if you look at uh, main uh, Europe, again, has been probably ahead of um, a lot of regions when we see globally and UK also too investing uh, more uh, decarbonization. We see uh, across all Europe, we see uh, clearly where Europe has been investing as a uh, the Green Deal and also the hydrogen also too, and we see also in the UK that is clearly, we have seen some countries have been ahead of, of most of the others invest in hydrogen, but I believe that uh, would be a good alternative of the fossil fuel also too. And uh, of course, and that the US also too has been lagging a little bit. And also we see China continue to also uh, leading and investing also in hydrogen as application. And we see of course other markets slowing, but Europe is probably, and UK also, to uh, leading in the technology to invest in a new technology like uh, uh, hydrogen, because hydrogen will be also, we start also in the UK investing for homes and a different kind of application. And I think that is a good thing. And is why, again, I, I believe that uh, Europe has been leading in, uh, in the change in emission and change of different technology and also especially hydrogen, that I believe that will be a very important for the future. Okay, thank you, Antonio. So I mentioned that this was a two-part question. So the second part is coming back a moment ago, you talked about people, the importance of people and culture, Matt. Uh, as we go through the transition, how are you thinking about what we need to do differently from people, from skills, from the talent? So there are, there's a skill shortage and there's a, a people shortage in the UK without any doubt. And you can see that with the companies that are coming into the UK to try and um, get our excellent engineers, our ex excellent developers and things that we have here. I mean, Lotus, for instance, we have um, just under 2,000 people, I think, in the UK now. We've got 300 vacancies. Most of those are in operations as we ramp up production um, for Amira, uh, but we still have uh, skill shortages across the, um, across the board. And uh, I, I, met, I introduced our ESG charter this morning, and a big part of that will be engagement. And we're finding that for us, we need to go much, much earlier in, in the process. You know, you need to be talking to children that are six, seven, to get them um, interested in these, I think it's called STEAM, STEAM subjects now rather than STEM, um, and, and get them engaged in, in engineering, in, in automotive, because it is such a valuable business. It's such a valuable business to the UK, but um, salary-wise and, and the benefits to the Exchequer as well. Uh, we just recently hosted uh, the Green Power Organisation. You know, it was 400 children racing on the iconic track at Hethel, where Matt Windles, oh no, no, uh, others like Ed and Senna, fit and have raced and things like that. So, um, I think I think engagement is important. I think most businesses are finding that they're going, they're having to take that on themselves. Uh, there's the apprenticeship levy, uh, which we're we're using as well for. Um, bringing apprentices into the business and upskilling our staff as well. But there's some real important high value jobs that need some focus and that's around cyber security uh, controls, onboard, offboard technologies, um, recycling, you know, management of uh, end of life batteries, those types of things. And I think there's a real opportunity for us through, through the government and through the education system in the UK to invest in those jobs because Let's be honest, those people will be exported in the future as well, or even better for us, that will attract business, keep attracting businesses to come to the UK because we've got those skill centres. Okay, so lots of great news there, lots of, uh, lots of opportunity, and lots of plans already in train. It's good to hear. Um, how about from your side, Antonio? 
Again, it's very similar. Again, uh, we have uh, Cumin has been over 70 years in uh, in uh, in the UK, and we have a great talent to solve engineers. And I see I mean, it's something that also I'm very um, conscious about what we need to do to make sure we maintain skills and also developing skills for tomorrow. Again, now we have a uh, great engineers out that can be also be able to be uh, able to work on. Uh, an engine that is a, a, a fuel cell engine, that because a fuel cell is an engine, how they can be able to work on different kind and develop them. And also, uh, I agree also with uh, Matt about what we are doing is a levy it has been a great uh, uh, offer from the from the UK government. We are working also very closely with the communities. Again, we are community has been huge on communities and getting us uh, also young uh, young China, uh, young um, uh, children also to be uh, liking the technical uh, the technical aspect of our business because it's not always easy we can we have uh, always a shortage of uh, engineers but it's something we are working with uh, some of our community partners across all UK we are doing also a lot of work on STEM and also engaging also uh, also women engineers also to be part of uh, of our our, uh, our our programs that we have across our our, our UK plants we have around 6,000 employees in UK that is important for us to maintain. And we have also the same shortages. Again, they are difficult to find people, especially in the, in the engineering. So, but we are working very closely with uh, all, uh, all, um, all uh, schools um, also to develop uh, engineers and for the future because the needs of, uh, of uh, will be different again uh, than we have seen today. And is how we can develop that we have our current engineers but also prepare for the future also in uh, electrification, uh, fuel cell, uh, that will be critical for the future. Okay, okay, thank you, Antonio. So I'm not sure if there are any questions in the audience. I'll ask one more question, then if there are, if you could maybe just uh, raise your hand and we'll try and get a mic to you, or we can maybe just see if we can hear you. Um, Matt, I'm intrigued. You just mentioned then kind of a little bit of a snippet that you've released a, a new ESG strategy. Could you say a few more words on that, please? Yes, yeah, so i um, proud to announce uh, Lotus's ESG charter this morning. And um, there's a press release gone out, and there's plenty of details on our uh, media site if you want. I think what we wanted to do was just consolidate all of the things that we're already doing. Um, we've talked about education and engagement. We're committed to battery electric vehicles as well. So we've put that in, the, in our commitment. Um, the culture you talked about, inclusiveness, uh, equality, is really important to us. I mean, we've spent the last uh, we've spent the last couple of years by uh, creating a lot of communities within the business, which is, has taken off, and I think it, it, it's really important. Um, and uh, we've also committed to the uh, COP26 CEF mandate as well. So it, it's kind of consolidating the work we've been doing, giving us focus under those pillars, and. Um, I'm really proud that Lotus is going to be leading the way. We're going to be the first um, established sports car manufacturer that is fully EV, um, and that's really important to us. I think um, I, I talked I talked at the start about the the issues of legacy with Lotus um, and investment, but that lack of legacy over the last 20 years has, off has obviously given us a really good opportunity as well that we were able to write a strategy. We wrote it back in 2017 um, around going battery electric and what the what the model uh, lineup would be, and it, it felt a little bit punchy back in 2017, <laughs> if I'm honest. But it's not now, is it? I mean, customer demand is really coming towards us as far as electrification is concerned, and um, it's great that we are able. To, we will be at the forefront of that that revolution into that industry as well, and um, and uh, there'll still be exciting cars. Okay, that's excellent. Great to hear. So is that, everybody goes to lotus.co.uk today? Take a look at that. <laughs> I'll sell any cars you want today. No, no. <laughs> excellent. Uh, and Antonio, again, you, you've got a slightly different perspective. What, what are your views around uh, sustainability strategy? Because, you know, we we're, we're all have a responsibility, and I'd say maybe even stronger than that, we've got an obligation as leaders in the industry that we need to make this change happen, and the next 10 years are going to be the most critical in this transition. So we all have a responsibility and an obligation to make it happen. Uh, how are Cummins looking at this, Antonio? We have our own, again, we have our own uh, Planet 2050 plan again for at Cummins, and we are all a very ambitious uh, plan for our facilities, our products to be become climate neutral by 2050. That is our story. We have announced a few years back, and uh, 
And I think that we have very strong goals for the 2030 to be achieved and also be able to reduce also our emissions and to be sustainable. We are also a member of the, of the Sustainable Market Initiative led by the Israel Highness Prince Charles. I think that has been important for us and we have been also coming to address on the Terra uh, Carta seal again, recognized as a business so committed to the focus on environment and sustainability. It's important for us again because we have, uh, we have um, uh, I believe that for attracting and also young talent about environment and social governance has become more very critical. We are committed, of course, to make a better world also too, and is why we are make sure that we reduce our mission across all our our plan, but also investing also in uh, in uh, in products to reduce emission by 2050s uh, and to be climate neutral by 2050 is our goal. Again, has been we have launched this uh, our plan probably two three years ago, and I think it has been quite also one of the strengths and one of the development we share with our customers and also our internal also our 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 our, our employees and they have been part of how we can be successful and we have been really as I said mentioned. We have been uh, quite successful in our commitment. We are a little ahead of our commitment for 2050 across all our plants in Europe, but uh, it's something that we are committed. And as you said, we have an important role to play, and we are committed also to be part of it. Okay. It's great to hear. It seems as though you have a very, very well thought through plan there, Antonio. I'm just wondering, what, what, do, you see, what, what do you see as being the most difficult part of that plan to execute? Is there anything that jumps out? Uh, uh, of course, again, that is, uh, probably is, uh, is, uh, the adoption for our product has been also, as I mentioned, we are moving also to, as uh, our industry is a little different than the passenger cars have a very clear direction about uh, electrification. For our industry, it's more difficult. It is adoption and also the investment. We need to partner with, uh, with the UK government in hydrogen, for example, but has been one of the most difficult we have because first to achieve only uh, we need to make our product also to, to be more uh, um, um, uh, reuse emissions over the next uh, next year. Again, the, the late uh, also the Eurozone, for example, has been one of the issues we see, and also how we can get also more adoptions from uh, from uh, as, uh, uh, for example hydrogen. So across all uh, all uh, all our, our products will be important, and the investments that we need also to infrastructure will be the one thing I think that is probably important for us. We need to have more infrastructure to help us to uh, adoption rate will be higher in our industry. Okay, thank you, Antonio. And I think that's the first time we've mentioned that word infrastructure so far. Uh, that's a whole mm -hmm. whole topic in its uh, on its uh, yeah. on itself. Um, let me just check. Are there any questions in the audience? Gentlemen down here. Hi, good morning. Uh, Brian Riley from Flag Software. Um, I, had, I had a question specifically for Matt. I think in, in Mike's opening comments, uh, he mentioned quality in the 70s. Um, and I think you may have particular insight to, to something here, Matt. When companies like Tesla tried to ramp up production, uh, very quickly, they had massive quality issues. Um, and I was surprised to hear you say moving from 1,600 to kind of 15,000 in, in three or four years. With the, the skill shortage, part shortage, uh, and just the, the technology and knowledge in ramping up production, um, how can you then make sure that you, you can focus on the quality and deliver the vehicles that you're known for um, and that you, your customers actually expect? Thank you for the question. Good question as well. Um, and I'll, I'll reference back to Geely, actually. Uh, you might be surprised to know, but the, pretty much the first word Geely always say to me when we have a conversation is quality. And that focus is on quality. And um, I don't know if many people in the room have been out to uh, China and seen the Geely products that they've got, but they are superb. I mean, really good quality. So what we've had to do is we've had to invest in quality. So you're right. Um, at the start of last year, we were still building the uh, we were still building the Elise, uh, and that was a hand-built process um, with uh, with guys and girls pushing cars around on trolleys in our factory. Since then, the transformation has been massive. As I mentioned, we've invested heavily in the factory, so we've now got semi-automated um, production. We've got quality controls in line. That's non-touch quality measurements, um, and the the focus on quality for us is huge because. 
as a business, if you, if you look at it as a return on the investment as well, warranty is a huge element of, uh, of your costs going forward. So it's really important that we've done the due diligence as we have through the process. Um, and part, part of us being slightly later to market is not all just parts as well. We wanted to make sure that everything was correct with the software and things like that. So, it, it, and it's, I think, going forward as well is quality with um, battery electric vehicles. And we talked about the infrastructure as well. Um, the training that's required. The, somebody mentioned recovery this morning when we're talking about it. It is a real transition that we need to get our head around, but it's happening. It's definitely happening in the UK. And I mean, they're leading with their, their um, regulation around the timings of um, stopping ice uh, combustion as well. So Lotus is a very different place from the 70s as far as quality is concerned, I'm pleased to say. And um, hopefully people will appreciate that when the products are out very shortly. Thank you, Matt. Um, I think there's one over here, gentlemen. Hello, uh, Richard Amanagama from Apollo Future Mobility Group. Um, we all know that the industry is in a lot of change at the moment. There's a lot of flux going on. And you need to pick technologies now, which may be quite sticky. Um, what is your time frame for saying, um, we're investing in this, when can we then, after making this investment, think about making a change because something much better has come along? And when do you think we may be into a more settled period where some of the key technologies are now in place and starting to get fixed? Is that to me or to Anthony? I think it's to both of you. Okay. Really. Uh, shall I go first then? Um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we came up with our strategy when Julie took over the uh, majority ownership of the business back in 2017. And we came up with a, a strategy called Vision 80. So, uh, 2018 we were 70 we wanted a strategy that took us to tw uh, to our 80th birthday which is um, now only four years away which uh, feels feels like tomorrow um, mm -hmm. so our commitment our investment in that transition over the business was over 10 years um, and it, it's something we've now started talking about is we need to start working on vision 90 because we're halfway through that strategy we we are committed to battery electric vehicles I think I think um, a business our size and with the resources we had, we really didn't have, we, we kind of had to pick a horse and back it, and, and we have. Um, where we expect to see developments coming through is in battery technology. Um, Lotus, we always strive for the lightest product we can get, the most innovative product we can get. And I think as more and more um, passenger vehicles definitely invest in, in the battery electric technology, it will be incumbent on suppliers to um, be innovative around technology is waiting, the cost as well. Um, so, yeah, as I say, we're committed to battery electric and the innovation we'll be looking for is around that technology. Okay, thank you, Matt. Antonio, were you able to hear that question okay? Yes, I, yes, I did very well. It was a good question and for our commercial vehicle, it's a little more difficult, as I mentioned. Again, we don't have a clear pass about what would be a as a future about what technology will be the best technology to our industry will be um, different powertrain solutions. I still believe that also for, for, for our industry, the hydrogen and also the fuel cell as a play to, but will be not probably in the next 10 years. So we see as a, it will have scale and will be important, but I still believe that we will be offering different kind of powertrain solutions. And again, the, the ice, uh, and then we continue to be uh, uh, available for the next uh, near future for the next 10 years or over. And also we have also investing in, in hydrogen also too. For fuel cells, that would be some uh, kind of application. But as I mentioned also too, is uh, linked to infrastructure. Again, we cannot do without infrastructure. And it's why it's uh, important to uh, play for the, uh, the government across all Europe and also globally to invest in, uh, in, uh, in hydrogen because I believe that is, uh, is also a future, but will be probably in, in different kind of application will be over 10 years probably in our, in our industry. But it will be a different kind of solution. I cannot uh, comment will be uh, yeah, is clearly that adoption on the last mile truck is growing in, with electrification and is a uh, good news. But also in uh, those application for construction, for example, is still not a very clear path about what would be the solution for the future. So why my, my answer is very different than that. We have different powertrain solution offering. And I think that uh, we'll see in the next uh, 10 years how, how we play. I still believe for all of them have a, a role to play in the future. 
and uh, some will be uh, adoption will be more quickly than the others, but I don't see a clear path as today what would be, and we'll be continue to invest in all the technology. Okay, okay, thank you, Antonio. Okay, so we've taken the liberty of just taking a few more minutes because the uh, previous session ended a little earlier, so we'll, we'll keep going if that's okay. Um, Matt, we've not, we've not touched on or talked about too much around consumers and, and you know, the people that buy the products and services. Um, there's a big change in the industry that's happened in terms of uh, the, the go-to-market model and different uh, retailing models that are coming to the fore. Um, maybe, could you talk to us about your agency model and what you, work you've done there? Yeah, I can. Um, and you're correct. Uh, uh, consumer interaction with um, the automotive industry is changing. And we see, I think we're seeing this in, in all walks of life, aren't we? That um, some people still want their traditional um, ability to go and feel, touch, smell a car, um, but others are happy to order a car online. Or, um, and we have decided, it, well, we have in the UK from the start of this year, we went to a direct selling model. So uh, traditional dealers, as they were, transitioned to agents, and they still are partners in our business as far as service and if customers want to collect their cars from uh, the agent, they can. But also, we've put in that flexibility for... Um, ad actually, an interesting fact out of that is out of, the, out of the owners in the UK that we have scheduled deliveries for, 50% of them want to come to the factory to collect their car. Um, so we've had to create this little <laughs> industry around... We, we weren't expecting the number to be so high, so it's like, OK, right, how are we going to manage this? How are we going to batch it? But um, it would be great because I think people want to be, uh, I said early on, we are a people business. Um, people want to be able to come, meet our staff, see where their car's been made, get the feel of that tradition that's there. Um, it doesn't come without its challenges. Um, obviously, we're now responsible for the car until the point it gets to the customer. Um, so you take on those costs of all the transport, mm -hmm. uh, the, the wholesale costs of holding the car in stock and all of those things. Um, however, it, it does come with its benefits as well with your direct interaction with the customers. Um, you can reduce the costs as well, particularly if 50% um, if, if of people are coming to collect their cars, that's, that saves on logistics costs for us getting those cars out from the factory as well. So it's, it's early days. Um, we haven't actually passed a car to a customer in the UK yet. We've done a few trial runs. Uh, I've been a dummy customer and I've been through the process. <laughs> uh, so we will see how it goes, but we're, we're very much looking forward to it. But as I said at the start as well, you know, the, the partners we're working with throughout the UK and Ireland as well are very important to us. And we, we held a, 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 com, a global conference at Hethel in April where we had over 300 um, representatives of dealers and agents around the world to Hethel and we showed them we showed them our future. We actually showed them what the next product is, which obviously I can't talk about much today, uh, so they can see that the, uh, the product lineup. Because what I should have said as part of Vision 80, we've already committed to the next three cars. So um, I'm, I'm doing a launch a year at the moment, and uh, we've got three more to go over the next five years. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's been quite busy. OK. And we'll continue to be busy, it seems. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Okay, so we've just got a few minutes left. So if we start to just um, bring it to a conclusion. So what I'd just love to hear from both of you, your thoughts on how can we ensure that we make the UK in the automotive industry survive and thrive for the future? Uh, and your thoughts on that? Maybe I'll come to you first, Antonio. Yeah, I think that uh, the UK automotive has also um, responded rapidly to the ever-changing dynamics that we have seen also and has a huge potential for in UK with the new technology and Cutting emissions, we have. Uh, we need uh, also the ensure to the UK remain and competitive and place a great place to invest. That I think that is important, especially in the light of the Brexit. I think that we have seen, uh, uh, and I don't want also. We need to maintain competitiveness in UK. That as I mentioned, we have our close to 6,000 employees for a long time. We have been 70 years in UK. Is a very important part. Uh, for, for us in uh, our network of uh, uh, globally, and we want to maintain, we have uh, great engineers and great people to be uh, uh, to lead in the in the technology also because that, that is important. And uh, we need to make sure that we maintain a competitiveness in the UK against uh, China, India, and also US. And is why I think that is important to uh, our government to help us to maintain uh, very strong uh, commercial sectors in UK. Is, uh, 
is as uh, so Matt says, a very high technology and capability in UK, and it has been for coming for a long time. And uh, for example, we have uh, we are working with the UK in the T Valleys region for our campus. Uh, for example, also with hydrogen, because I I mentioned a few times that hydrogen is important, but as the uh, UK is investing also in hydrogen, and we are part of it, is why I think that I I believe that we have a bright also. Uh, Future with uh, in UK, and we appreciate the help from the government to make sure they continue to be uh, aging technology and also invest in uh, green technology like hydrogen electrification. That I think that is important, but uh, but we need to maintain, make sure we maintain a competitiveness in the UK. That is important. Okay, thank you, Antonio and Matt. I think I'll start by saying that I'm very excited about the future. I think uh, I talked about it before. The opportunities in front of us. Um, Change, change is always an opportunity to, uh, to, to innovate and grow. And um, I think it's really important. I mean, Mike, Mike said in his introduction that we need to get Brexit done. We need to get the regulation in place so we know as auto manufacturers what regulations we're working to. I think, um, in, in a way, our focus on where we're going with technology has given us clarity because it means that we will um, meet the regulations around zero emissions vehicles and, and our timing for it as well. Uh, but we do need some help. Um, I mean, the, the skill shortage is big um, and we, uh, we need some help around infrastructure as well because ultimately the, for us, for, the, or for all of us as groups, is the transition to a cleaner environment and cleaner products it's got to come with simplicity as well. So people want to know that these products are going to work, that they can charge them, um, that there's availability around. But I think you said it as well, you know, we've all got to do something. The climate needs action. Mm -hmm. Climate needs action. It needs action desperately now. And I think the automotive industry and the people in this room have got the opportunity to really impact future generations through what we're doing now. Okay, wonderful. Okay, Antonio, Matt, thank you so much. I think that brings this uh, panel to a conclusion. I think we're handing back over to Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.